name of the Father, and Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. It was very, very fitting that I came in today for the first time. Did you guys do this every week or something? No? Uh, it's first time. time. Okay, it's very fitting that on the first time it's done, I walk in, and the topic today is spiritual bankruptcy, and then I sit down, and then you guys start singing, and it makes me feel so, so, so much better. The first thing it made me think of, I'll read you a small passage of Samuel. It's the story of Saul and David. Very, I'm just going to read you a small part, but it's basically when a distressing spirit, when David, when Saul became depressed because he stopped following the Lord and the Lord's teachings and the Lord's ways, he started to become depressed. He started to have like this distressed spirit, the Bible calls it. So he would ask around. He's, he's telling everyone that's around him, all the people that give him advice. Everybody, he's like, I'm depressed. I have this distressed spirit. So everyone tried to give him advice. It wouldn't work, whatever, until someone came and told him, look, we know this young lad whose name is David. He is a beautiful singer. And what David would sing would be the Psalms that you guys have today in your bear, the book of Psalms in the Bible. David would come and he would harmonize. He would make those Psalms into music and he would play them on the harp. And the Bible tells us, whenever the Spirit from God was upon Saul, that David would take a harp and play it with his hand. Then Saul would become refreshed and well and, distre and the distress in the Spirit would depart from him. So this is what, exactly what it made me feel like. It, it's like every time he would pray like words to God in such a beautiful way, that sadness would go away, that depression would go away. And that's exactly how I felt because, like I told you guys many times, I never come to speak about something if it's not something that I suffer with myself. So today is about spiritual bankruptcy. What does that mean or what did I want to mean by spiritual bankruptcy? You guys ever feel that... Prayer becomes very, like, enter those times where praying becomes very hard, reading your Bible becomes very hard, doing the right thing, coming to church becomes very hard. Suddenly, you used to go to waking up every Sunday to come to liturgy, but then you don't feel like it anymore. It's, like, too early. You don't want to. You don't feel it. You walk in and you feel like almost like a stranger because your the vibe's not there. You try to stand before God to pray before you go to bed and like you used to be able to pray something and then now it's just like you're like dying to just, you know, say the Lord's Prayer. And then it's like this thing that just keeps going. It's snowball effects. It becomes, is that just me? Am I crazy? Does that happen to anybody else? Yeah, okay. I was starting to get worried. Everyone's like, what are you talking about? I was like, well, maybe I should seek help. Anyway, so, and what happens is it snowballs. It snowballs. Why does it snowball? Because we let it snowball into us becoming having this state of anxiety, this angst about everything, that we don't, just don't care anymore. So we let the small thing, that little dryness, instead of fighting through spiritual dryness, okay, we stop fighting completely, we give up, we let the devil just take us with the flow. And then we find ourselves, and this is the dangerous part, we find ourselves falling into temptations, we find ourselves doing things that we used to find very wrong, but now we think of them, or we do them, or we're tempted by them, and it's okay because that feeling inside of us is completely like, ugh, I couldn't care. Like, you feel like you're stuck in mud, in quicksand, and it's swallowing you, and it's swallowing you. And that's the exact state of my life right now, okay? But not, I mean, it's, it's like this daily fight. It goes and comes, okay? So walking in today, like, you guys just proved one of my last points of today was fellowship, okay? I'm going to start, like, from reverse just because it just happened. Having each other, having something like this, as soon as I came in, it reminded me of how sweet it was to praise Jesus' name, how sweet it was to be with people who want to praise Jesus' name. Suddenly that distressed feeling kind of started to melt away. I didn't have that anymore. It was very weird. I don't know. Maybe I'm just like some soft story, honey. But it's like just listening to you guys sing is so beautiful and so like, I don't mean to be mushy and weird, but anyway, it just, it gives you that feeling that like, it's okay, like God's here for us and and regardless of what mistakes we make, regardless of what happens, like it doesn't matter. And that's the whole point of today, is how do we want to deal with this spiritual bankruptcy or spiritual storm that like we feel like we're in this storm, and how to not go back into it. But before I tell you about that, I want to tell you a little bit story about my son. So I have a son and a daughter, but my son hates me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> He's two and a half years old. He, he loves us very much, me and my wife, but he is very... Um, I'm uh, not How do you say this in English? Huh? No, not disciplined is like one of those like understatements of the century. He's kind of like, he wants to find the way to make me miserable. And <laughs> savage, savage. What? Savage. Oh, so much, Okay? Oh, so much. But he loves us a lot. And he knows that when he disappoints 
disappoints us, he's disappointing us. But he still always drives us crazy. So I'll give you a little bit of example. It may have been, what day was our meeting? Wednesday night, Thursday night? Wednesday. Wednesday? So I guess Tuesday night or Wednesday night, whichever one it was. No, it was Wednesday night after I left. So we had a little meeting, okay, for church. We went everything, it finished late and whatever. So I went home and by the time I got into bed, it was 12.30, okay? It's like past midnight. And I have to wake up because I work in corn, whatever. It's a yeah, long story short. I have to wake up really early. And then at like 12.45, Nathaniel waited until I fell asleep for 15 minutes. I don't know if anyone's ever woken you up after the first 15 minutes. You want to kill yourself because <laughs> it's like the deepest, coziest. You just got under the blanket. It's like the best moment of your life. And then he starts screaming, cover, cover, cover. And I'm like, Enta Manu. So I go to the room. I'm like, what's happening right now? So he's like, my cover. I'm like, so put your cover back on you. So my new name. If anyone doesn't speak Arabic, I'm telling my son, why are you being crazy? Anyway, so basically I'm telling him, like, why are you being insane? Like, just cover yourself. So he's like, cover, cover. His eyes are closed, he's sleeping, but he's yelling at me while he's sleeping. <laughs> Put on his cover, and I go back to bed. Then I hear, <laughs> so I go next door. His sister's crying. I'm like, what's wrong with you? She's like, I need to pee. And I'm like, so go pee. So then she goes to pee. At this point, it's like 1.15, okay? So I go to bed, I tell my wife, I'm like, I'm not getting up again, you get up, these are not my children, I'm going to sell them in the morning. So then, I don't even know why I'm telling you the story, it's short, but here we go. So then Nathaniel, I get back into bed, and then Nathaniel goes, my door is closed, my door is closed. I'm like, is this Like, what happened, like, what, what's wrong then? So this went on until about 5 o'clock in the morning, okay? I wanted to kill myself, I'm not going to lie. So all this was, I was very angry. Okay, and I went to work angry. At work, I was angry, which is not good for a dentist. Don't ever go to the dentist if your dentist is angry. Okay, so I was angry at work, and then I come, and then so my wife were talking all day, like, how are we going to stop this? This needs to stop. We need to teach them a lesson. And she tells me, like, what are you going to do? I'm like, I'm going to murder them when I get home. I'm going to teach them a lesson. There's going to be like death when I get home. She's like, okay, just calm down. There's no problems. Just like, tell me what, how you're going to punish me. I'm like, don't worry about it, I got this. And I'm mad all day, and I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm going to punish him when I get home. I get home, and they see me, and they're like, Daddy! And this guy hugs me, and he says, sorry, Daddy, I love you, and that's it. And he just ruined my whole plan. Ruined everything. Everything was ruined in 10 seconds, because he knew exactly what it was. And this is exactly what I want to read you about God today. I, I got to tell you, nothing has taught me more about our relationship with God as much as having my own child. Nothing I read ever could describe it. Nothing could tell you what it is. You could read, you could be told, but until you have your own children, you'll never understand what it means. So I will read you two things, and then you'll understand, okay? The first one is this. If we say that we have no sin, well, sorry, here, here, here it goes. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is 1 John chapter 1, verses 8. Okay, he says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the second thing I wanted to read, St. Paul says in Galatians chapter 4, Because you are sons and daughters, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, Father, therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. You're going to tell me, what does this mean? And I'll tell you, it means exactly what my son did to me. That there is nothing, there is nothing you could do, there's nothing you could say, there's no action, there's nothing in your life that you can't just go and say, Father, forgive me for I have sinned. Right? The prodigal son did everything. He took his inheritance, which means people don't realize when you go to your father and you tell him, give me my inheritance, what does that mean? You guys know what that means? Right. Inheritance is something you get when your father dies. When he goes to his father and he says, give him my portion of my inheritance, give me my portion of my inheritance, he's telling his father, give me my money, you're dead to me. That's basically what he's telling his father. He's telling him, give me my money, you're dead to me. And then he goes and spends it in prodigal living. He doesn't take it and goes and makes a business and makes his life better so that maybe his father can get over it and be proud of him. No. He goes to a faraway land, neglects his father and his mother. He spends it all on prodigal living. So he probably spends it on girls, on alcohol, on drugs, whatever it be at the time, prodigal living, could be anything. 
And then he has nothing left to the point where he starts to eat with animals in the farm, whatever the pigs eat, he'll eat because he's going to starve to death. And he thinks to himself, let me just try and go back. Let me just try. I have nothing to lose. I'm eating food of the pigs. What's the worst case that can happen to me? I'd rather die. Let me go back. And you know what? I'm not going to tell my father, look, I'm your son. Take me back. No, I'm going to tell him, look, I'm working here like a slave. Just take me back as a slave. I'd rather be a slave for you. So he goes back, and before he can enter into the gate of their... They all had farms and stuff, so it's like a long road, if you guys have ever seen. Before he can get through to get to his father, his father sees him from afar as if he's been waiting all this time. So his dad, it's as if his dad was sitting in the window depressed, okay, looking for him every day. Instead of him thinking, I'm going to go tell him, let me be a slave, please don't be mad at me. His father comes to him falls on him, hugs him, kisses him, and forgives him before he can even say anything. That's the relationship we have with our Father in heaven. So the problem with spiritual bankruptcy is never a problem with God. God is never the problem. Because God is just waiting for us to look at Him. He's a sweet Father. He's a compassionate Father. He's the Father who, regardless of how many times we stab Him in the back, no matter how many times we crucify Him, no matter how many times we spit in His face, He's always willing to accept us before we even ask to be accepted. Yes? Yes. So why are we the problem? So that's very good that you acknowledge it. Why are we the problem? You know why we're the problem? Hmm? What? I don't know. That's why I'm here. Good. <laughs> we're the problem because we refuse to accept His kindness. We're the problem because we refuse. We refuse to accept how easy it is. We refuse, and a lot of times we let the devil corrupt our minds, we refuse to believe that he can actually be so loving. And when someone comes to tell me, what's the difference between Christianity and all the other religions? I tell them, very, very simple. This is the difference. I'm trying to find it so I can read it to you. Okay, here. God demonstrates his own love towards us. This is Romans chapter 5, verse 8. If there's no verse that you know, this is the verse to, to, to memorize. God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Do you understand the weight of this sentence? This sentence is not saying, you go clean yourself, you go be better, you go become a better person, do this, go to church, be uh, friends with everybody, and then come back, and then I'll forgive you. No. He's saying God demonstrates His own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When He died for us, we were guilty. We were very guilty. We were deserving of death. We were all sinners. And He chose that moment to die for us. So then St. Paul says, how much more then, how much more then, having now been justified by His blood, which means now He bought us, He made us His children. So now, you and me are His children. How much now, how much more now that we're His children by His blood, okay, shall we be saved from wrath through Him? So He's saying, before you were my child, I was ready and I did die for you. Now that I died for you and I made you my son, and my daughters, how much more will I do anything to save you from punishment, to save you from fire, from hell, from, from, from depression, from distressed spirit, from all evil? How much more now that you are my children, right? So He reconciled us. He made us His children while we were sinners. How much more now that we're His children will He accept us? St. Paul says, he, sorry, St. John says, He is faithful, He is faithful to forgive us. But we refuse to believe. And because we refuse to believe how easy it is, we then don't repent. And when we don't repent, we stay in this constant, constant, vicious cycle of, I don't repent, so I still have this feeling of, I can't like, bear to be in the church, which means you're not taking communion, which means you're not praying, which means you're not having a relationship with God, and it gets worse and worse until we let the devil steal from us the life that God died to give us. Do you guys get it? Do you guys understand what, what, what we're saying? So then what do we do? Okay. The, the question now is, what, what happens next? God has forgiven us. 
He will forgive us. He continues to forgive us. There is nothing that we can do to have Him not forgive us because His love for us is infinite. And infinite means it's encompassing of all things that we can do wrong from here to tomorrow in whatever severity. Alright? And the church's examples of all the saints that we have do not end of people who are murderers, people who are adulterers, people who are fornicators, people who are homosexual, people who are whatever. And they found Christ through His mercy and through His compassion. And it didn't matter what their old life was like because He restored them to a new life. Okay? It doesn't matter. If a murderer like St. Moses could become St. Moses, how much more anyone else? If a thief who lived his whole life could be turned to while Jesus in his most painful moment on the cross and telling him, today you will be with me in paradise, how much more all of us can we be saved? So the question is not, will he stay mad at us? That's an unequivocal no. Don't let the devil ever, ever, ever make you believe that God is mad and that he's staying mad and that you cannot be forgiven. This is from the devil. It cannot be something that you ever accept. Okay? It's like if I came to you, okay, and I told you, your father hates you. His biological father, okay? It's like I go to Amir and I tell him, if anyone doesn't know, Father Yohanna is Amir's dad, okay? And I go to Amir right now outside and tell him, watch yourself. The next time uh, Father Yohanna sees you, he's going to kill you. And he's very mad at you. Don't come back home because he will not accept that you sleep in your house. There's nothing I can say to Amir to convince him of this. Nothing. There's nothing. Regardless of what he's done, he could have hit someone with a car, he could have killed his mother with a car, and his father still would not say that about him, okay? True or not true? True. Okay? So there's nothing I can do to go to here and tell him, your father will not accept you, do not enter your house. But that's what the devil tricks us with every day. He says, you're disgusting. You're disgusting, don't go back at him. He's holy. And the devil is very crooked, very wicked. As if by he believes and he wants to worship God, he'll tell you, no, God is holy. You're not holy. Don't, don't go back to God. You're disgusted. And He'll let us sit and, and sit in our filth and feel that we're not worthy. Meanwhile, while we were sinners, God chose to die for us. How much more now that we're His children? He would never say those words to us. Never. He went to a woman who was caught in the act of adultery. I.e., they found her in bed with another man in the act, red-handed. And He would, looked away and said, if any of you is without sin, throw the first stone. And then He looked at her and He says, is anyone here to judge you? I, I don't judge you either. That's the God that we have. So when someone tells me what's the difference, that's the difference. That's Jesus is the difference. The love of Christ is the difference. Okay? So in terms of forgiveness, we can all get past that. So regardless of what my son does to me at night or destroys me, I will never ever deny that he is my son. There is nothing he can do where I will wake up, although that morning I was very close, and wake up and say, you are no longer my son, get out of my house. It will not happen. In fact, one time he punched me in the face four times. Oh, what a shot It's a bit crazy. Okay? And every time he punched me, he laughed. And I wanted to laugh, but it's not okay that he punched me. It hurts. Okay? So I punched him back. No, I'm just... so, so I was very mad at him, and I slapped him on the hand or whatever I did, okay, to, to punish him, because he punched me four times in the face. After each time, I told him, don't punch me in the face. And he still didn't answer. He hit me, like, actually punched me. So I'm like, Nathaniel, don't punch daddy again. And he punched me again. I'm like, Nathaniel. You know, punch dirty again. The third time, I'm like, what I had to do? And then he hit me the fourth time, so I punished him. And put, it, do you guys know how long it took him to come back crying and give me a hug and give me a kiss and be like, I'm really sorry, Dad? Do you know how long it took? As I was yelling at him, he was already doing it. So sorry, Dad. Yeah, no, I you said that. Yeah, he doesn't want to get punished. No, I punished him already. I already slapped him a hand and told him, go sit in the corner or whatever. And he's like, I'm sorry. And hugging and kissing, and he's tapping on my back. We talked about it. I'm like, and at that moment, you're like, there's nothing. There's nothing he could do. He could probably take a knife to my throat, and if I survive the incident, I'll probably still love him. Like, there's no doubt. So, being loved, that's not the issue. What's the issue, God? The issue is what comes next. How do we avoid this life? How do we live for something greater? The world is going to offer you the same thing all the time. It's, it's not hard. Every movie that comes out, every song that comes out, every commercial that comes out, it's about one of probably three things. Uh, party hard until you get drunk, have a lot of sex, and the third one is buy something that's very, very expensive. That's, you could probably limit every single commercial for now to the rest of your life, every advertisement, and the best ones. Name a commercial off the top of your head. Go. Uh, hmm? uh, Pepsi. 
Nafsi Bigma, that's a Hagar Gabi. Nafsi Bigma, very good. The most famous commercials, okay? There's a guy, I was actually listening to the interview. Do you guys know the Dos Equis guy? The Stay Thirsty, my friend? Do you guys ever see that on the, the, the most interesting man in the world? Do you ever see that commercial? Anyways, this guy made a career, made a career by that slogan, okay? The whole most interesting man in the world. Why is he the most interesting man? Because Dos Equis, the beer company, tells us he's the most interesting man. A career! He made a career off this thing. He was living in his car until he became the Dos Equis beer guy. And now he is the Dos Equis guy. He just got fired? It doesn't matter. No, he moved. <laughs> anyway, all this to say, the world will sell you three things and it will sell you the same three things over and over and over. It will sell them to you in every movie, in every song, in every show, in every advertisement. It's not very difficult. You don't have to look very far. Every billboard, every bus passing you, everything will be about have a lot of sex, have a lot of alcohol and buy a lot of things, okay? It's the devil's way to do it because he knows what the short-term way to our heart is, okay? The short-term way to everyone's heart is those three things, okay? Those three vain things. Problem is, fantastic, you buy all the things in the world, you're never full. This is a common thing, this is how economics work, okay? No one ever buys one purse, okay? A nice purse to all the girls. No one ever buys one nice purse and says, I'm good for the rest of my life. That's not how that one works. Usually how it works is I buy one nice one, I'm thinking of when I'm going to get the next one, and probably if you have a nice one, you want the next one faster than someone who doesn't, okay? That's how all things work. The iPhone cycle is two years. Why is it two years? Because they make it so that the update slows your phone so much that for you to text someone back, if you're more than two years late, it makes you throw it against the wall, break it, so you buy a new one. Okay? Anyone ever have like an iPhone that's like three years old or late? Yeah, how long does it take you to send an email? Like five minutes? Yeah? Okay. This is how the world works. Buy more, buy more, buy more, or have party time, get drunk, lose yourself, have a good time, or more women, more men, more women, more men. It's a shallow life, and then we always see what the end of that life ends in. It's demise, because there's no satisfaction. At the end of the day, you can have bought everything you want, you'll never have bought the whole world. At the end of the day, you can have had sex with everyone in the world, but it will never be satisfied, it will be an addiction. If anything, it will start to tear at your heart, because you've given your heart to so many people that no one person has the key to your heart anymore, the whole world does, and no one is special to you anymore. This is how the world works. So this is what the devil is selling you. But what God is trying to convince you of is that you don't need this world, you don't need these things. That what you need is each other, what you need is Him. So what's next? After you get forgiveness and after you realize that you're always forgiven, what's next? St. Paul tells us, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. He's saying they both fight against each other. Your Spirit and your flesh will always fight each other. Your Spirit will tell you, no, look at something better. Your Spirit will tell you, look, give to the person who is hungry in the street. You will buy for yourself happiness in the kingdom of heaven. Instead of going to buy another person, go buy for someone something to eat. Right? That's what the Spirit will say, but the body will say, no, I'd rather have this thing. Right? The Spirit will tell you, keep your chastity. I know everyone has a boyfriend, everyone has a girlfriend, but everyone gets broken up and has their heart broken and it never leads to anything. And then they have bad memories and bad experiences and then they're traumatized. And then, but God's trying to tell you, keep your heart for the person that you will have that will be yours and yours only and you will be theirs and theirs only. He's trying to tell you, I am here to be the person that you hold on to, to have the strength in a world that's trying to sell you all these evil things, right? So he's saying, and these are contrary, the flesh and the spirit are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. He's saying we don't even have control over our own minds, our own bodies, because of the evil that is in this world, because of all the stuff that we surround ourselves with, we want to be holy, but we see a bus pass by and there's a girl on it who's not wearing clothes and the guys are like, I'm trying to be holy here, give me a break! And then something happens. We try to be giving or whatever and we work hard and then we walk into the mall and there's something advertised that's beautiful, that's very expensive, that's new and I want it and I worked hard for it and then that steals some more of our spirit. They fight against each other and they fight against each other day and night. So then, 
How do we walk in the Spirit? St. Paul tells us in Ephesians, he says, I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. This is something that we pray every morning in prime prayer, okay? We read this every morning in prime prayer for this reason. We're telling them, God, help me to walk in the way that you see fit, worthy of the calling. What is the calling? Okay? He says, walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Sometimes we use this word, I was called. You guys know what that means, called? What does it mean? Hmm. Hmm? Chosen. chosen. Very good. So sometimes we think we're chosen as like all oh, the priest was chosen. He was called. But no, we're all called. Anyone who knows that Jesus is their Savior is called. It's called for what? Called to show the rest of the world who God is. To show the rest of the world what it's like to live a life in Christ. What it's like to have peace and that joy. You'll tell me, but I'm shy. I don't want to talk. Don't talk. Words are very, very, very cheap. Live. If anyone tells me I'm shy, no problem. I'm not telling you to go in the metro and preach. That probably won't be as useful as you walking. Walking the walk that people talk. Walk that. Walk it. Walk that life with Christ. So that when people see that you're different, they look at you and they be like, why are you different? There is something different about you. Because whether you like it or not, the whole world is the same. And you are the only unique ones. Which is crazy. Because the devil has made us all think that being unique is a bad thing. When in the rest of the world, being unique is something that everyone praises. You're unique, they say. But when it comes to sin, when it comes to religion, when it comes to Christianity, when it comes to spiritual life, if you're unique, people look at it and be like, oh, these, these foolish Christians who believe that God created the world. It's like, okay, you believe that you created the world or that nothing created the world. That makes a lot more sense than God created the world. Go ahead. I don't need to talk with you. I'm just going to live my life. And you live your life as if there's no God. And at the end of the road, or somewhere on that road, you will see something very different. Provided we live and walk the walk worthy of the calling. Alright? So that's what St. Paul is telling us. He's telling us, walk. You don't need to speak about it. You don't need to do anything. And then what does he say about it? He says... With long suffering, in lowliness and gentleness, in humility and gentleness, okay? With long suffering, bearing with one another in love, okay? Endeavoring to keep the unity. And this is where it comes full circle, we're done, okay? To what we started with today the unity. The unity that we have with one another, that's what keeps us strong. That's what keeps the faith going. That's what helps us come out of any funk that we're in, to, to come out of any hard time that we're in. Fellowship, okay? Keep the walk together. Find people who have the same principles as you, who have the same beliefs as you, and strengthen each other. The world is a tough place, and there are very few of us in it. So be strengthened with one another, okay? It's very, very difficult. And then he goes on and says a lot of things that, like, keep away from you anger and wrath, and the Christian person should be a person who has a smile on their face and is gentle all the time. Not angry not bitter, not jealous. We're different than the world. We're supposed to be different. When someone tells us something, we don't have jealousy, we have happiness for them. We show compassion, we show empathy. We don't try to outdo each other, outbuy each other, outperform each other. No, we help each other out. I went to Sejap in Marianopolis. You guys know Marianopolis? It was one of those places where if you needed notes from someone, they might actually remove your kidney before they give you notes to the class. It was the worst thing that I've ever been part of, because everyone wants to get into medicine at the same time, okay? So I'm like, I missed the class, and like some Chinese girl looked at me and she's like, and I was like, okay, great, <laughs> all right, people here are really nice, like this is crazy. No, the Christian doesn't worry about that, God will bless me if I work hard and it's fine. Help everyone around you, so what if they get ahead? God is able to bless you in a day more than anyone can accomplish in a lifetime on their own power, in one day, right? So final things, fellowship is crucial. The other thing that's very important, and I don't want you guys to ever minimize it, and I don't want you guys to ever forbid yourself from it, that's communion. Our lifeline, our buoy, you know when someone's drowning and they throw him that big orange thing that's like a donut and you hold on to so that you don't drown? Our buoy, our lifeline, buoy is a funny word, I'm going to say 
Our buoy, very, very random, sorry. Uh, our lifeline is communion. And why do I tell you communion? We look at communion as resurrection. We look at communion as resurrection. When we say, Amen, 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 Ton Sana Ton So, in the liturgy, which is your death, O Lord, we proclaim your holy resurrection, we confess. All right? We're about to partake in the resurrection, okay? Can you resurrect something that is not dead? Huh? No. So if I tell you communion is resurrection, what is the one criteria of communion for a person? That they have to be dead. Which means what? You cannot spiritually resurrect someone that is walking in thinking they're worthy. So any point of your life where you think, I'm too sinful, I can't take communion, that's probably that moment right there where you are most worthy to take communion. I remember I was in Africa and there was this Bible study with one of the priests, this is really wonderful, and I had this big issue with communion where I felt guilty every time I did a sin, like right before communion, as if it was one of those things where it's like, you know, give me absolution, I take communion, so that like I'm still clean. And he told me, any time you think you're clean to take communion, that's when you should probably not to take communion. Because no one is worthy of the body and the blood of Christ. No one is worthy to walk in front of that altar with Christ on it and say, I am worthy of you. The second that you think, you open your mouth to take the body and blood of Christ and say, I've done everything I've had to do, I'm good. I did my bear, my readings, I went to Tazbah last night, I'm good. That's the time where you should take a step back and realize who it is you're about to become one with. So anyone that comes feeling sinful, anyone that comes feeling weak, Provided you're not happy about it and that you're repentant, which is something that takes seconds to repent. A man who was a thief, a robber, a murderer his whole life repented in seconds on the cross next to Jesus and stole the kingdom of heaven with a few words. Okay? It takes seconds for you to feel repentant. That's when you are most worthy of communion. So don't ever, ever forbid yourselves from communion based on that. Because it is for those who are sick. Those who are not sick have no need for a physician. Jesus said it in his own words. I'm here for the sick. I'm not here for those who think they're great and not sick and fine. So fellowship, crucial. One another. Two, communion, crucial. Third one, your quiet time with God. We always say quiet time, quiet time. Your quiet time with God. Why quiet time? Because that's when you sit and have a relationship. You can't have a relationship with someone if you don't speak to each other. That's what prayer is. You can't have a relationship with someone if you don't listen to them. That's what reading the scriptures is, reading the Bible, reading spiritual books. That's the type of relationship. So that's how we for, you know, prevent ourselves from coming back into this mess. Okay? Thank you all for helping me tonight. I'm not even joking. This was very therapeutic for me. And glory be to God for everyone. Does anybody have any questions? Anybody have any questions? Yes. Sometimes it's not about the church. Like, I'm sure that God will forgive me. I know that God will. Like, I'm 